not wearing masks while we talk, right? Or sorry, that was a weird way to phrase it. Does anyone not feel comfortable with that? <laughs> please, please speak up if you don't feel comfortable with no masks. Just for us, you guys still. Good. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, you guys can decide amongst yourselves, for yourselves, but yeah. I think this is like a good 12 feet. Yeah. All right, thank you everyone to, for coming to join us at uh, the first Zine Library event. We're very excited to host this conversation about art and activism and how that connects with climate change and many of the other changes in our world. Um, so I would like to introduce, introduce to you Eric Ruin and Anuj Shrestha. So Eric is a Michigan-raised, Philadelphia-based printmaker, shadow puppeteer, and paper cut artist, um, as well as other things who has been lauded by the New York Times for his spell-binding cut paper animations. His work oscillates between the poles of apocalyptic anxieties and utopian year yearnings, um, with an emphasis on empathy, transcendence, and obsessive detail. He frequently works collaboratively with musicians, theater performers, other artists, and activist campaigns. He is a founding member of the International uh, Just Seeds Artists Co Cooperative, and co-authored, um, and a co-author of the book Paths Towards Utopia: Graphic Explorations of Everyday Anarchism. Um, current projects include the Omnius Cloud Ensemble, an ever-evolving, collectively improvising large ensemble for projections and music, which at times has included um, and includes members of the Sun Ra Orchestra, Bardo Pond, and Espers. Um, you can visit his website for more information. Anu Shrestha um, is an illustrator and cartoonist who resides in Philadelphia. His comics have been listed on several editions of the Best American Comics Anthology. His illustrated works have appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, Wired, Playboy, McSweeney's, and others. Um, he's fond of Italian horror cinema and chihuahuas, <laughs> which is excellent to know. <laughs> um, as we are discussing today, we want you to have a chance to look at their work. Um, zines specifically are a very interactive um, piece of art, and we want you to be able to see them. So um, we're going to have uh, some works p passed around, and of course, if there's anything that you feel com you would have, you would feel more comfortable with somebody like one person holding and taking around. Leah, could we ask you to do that? Um. Is it okay, but can I introduce these things? I don't know if you want to introduce them. Sure, yeah. yeah. That sounds like an excellent <laughs> way. Please tell us about your art. Um, just it feels like a nice intro, entry point. Um, so there's two books that I brought with me. They're both silkscreened artist books, accordion books. Um, one of them is called Hard Rain, a letter from Cassiodorus. And it's, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but um, one of the things that's, so there's text in it, but it's screen printed backwards on the reverse. So you have to actually, to see it, you have to hold it up to a, to read it, you have to hold it up to a light source, um, and then you can kind of read it through the image, read the text through the image is the conceit of it. And uh, the text is from this uh, Roman uh, politician from 538 AD named Cassiodorus, and he's talking about uh, climactic change in the wake of Krakatoa and the shift in unreliability of the seasons, fruit withering on the vine, etc. I thought it was interesting to juxtapose this like ancient text uh, of climactic change against like current events. So there's images from protests in Hong Kong, people getting vaccinated through the Black Doctors COVID Consortium here in Philly, and um, and people running from tear gas in Palestine. So oh, wow. kind of talking about heavy weather of many kinds, and obviously the subtext being about climate change in our day. And this one, they're both like weirdly classicist, which is just a thing that I like. Um, the other one's called Beacons Along the Way, which is screen print and spray paint. Um, and it's um, bigger, as you can see, and it's just sort of all these. It's based on the, um, an image from the Orestria, um, which is uh, by Aeschylus, uh, like Greek, ancient, I think it's Aeschylus, I always get those guys confused. Um, but uh, talking about like, so the announcing the end of the Trojan War by lighting a series of beacon fires, and then one person sees the giant fire, and the next person sees the giant fire, 
um, and then it's passed along that the war has ended. And so then thinking about like what are these beacon fires in our present era? What are the things we're being warned against? How are these messages being relayed? So yeah, you can have a look at them. Um, maybe you know if you have a bunch of sauce on your hands, let somebody else hold it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how. Yeah, Leah will. Oh, Leah will get cool. it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Nanoosh, do you want to talk about the scenes you've brought? Yeah, so I brought um, just a handful of books. Uh, this is the most recent one. It's called New Fears. Uh, this is the this is just like a series of like four panel. Uh, the sort of structure conceit is just four panel comics, each covering a different topic. Everything from like climate change to like carceral system to immigration um, and to like personal personal like fears. So um, yeah. I'll pass that around, and uh, this one is called Interiors, and this is basically uh, a collection of uh, sketchbook drawings that were thematically linked by uh, sort of thinking about the lives of refugees and uh, populations in uh, high conflict areas, particularly everywhere from like Syria to Palestine to Iraq. And this was actually created in 2015. Um, after the uh, Israeli invasion of Gaza. And basically this was, uh, I was kind of also modeling it after like old classical uh, anatomy drawings. Um, and, and the last two are uh, also a series of like sketchbook drawings. And these are also kind of like exploring like the othering of like disenfranchised communities, but also, but doing it through like kind of surreal faces and and that kind of thing. But yeah, feel free to look at both of those as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for coming out and sharing your work. Um, so we can start with, as we're passing all of this work around, um, in my opinion, one of the best things about like print and zines is the ways in which they circulate among communities and kind of build links between people through trade and um, that sort of like making art together is being just a natural part of the medium. So what do you feel about um, art allows you to kind of connect with people and to communicate your ideas with others? And like, how have you found that that comes across in your practice? Should I take it first? Yeah, yeah I feel like, um, I think art, the, uh, at least the, you know, particularly like illustration and comics in particular, uh, it's it's an easy way to sort of ex like sort of <laughs> reduce like a very complicated idea into something that's like immediately striking or compelling. And uh, with comics, typically uh, through the you know the nature of it being a sequential medium, it's you can like either take it to a narrative form and tell the story about a, like a literal sort of depiction of like you know, a, a political moment mm -hmm. um, or, or, or a time. Or you can, like, what I often try to do is um, give it a little bit of ambiguity and uh, and sort of fold in these really political ideas with, like, kind of personal drama or mm -hmm. personal insecurities or fears and sort of leave it up to the audience to kind of draw the connecting lines between them. Um, yeah, can people hear me okay? I guess I should use this microphone. Um, <laughs> I always think that I have such a loud voice that I'll, it'll be carried, but I think it's not always as loud as I think it is. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like art is just for me, it's like what I have, you know, it's like the tools that I have. I don't know that like when we think about um, things that can make change in the world or things that are communicative, that like art is inherently more valorized than any other form of communication or form of activism in particular. In fact, in some ways less, right? Because it has so many aspects of ego bound into it and things like that. But for me, it's just what I have. Like, I grew up as a fairly alienated uh, suburban youth, you know? And like, uh, that was, to me was the tool I had to like express myself. Um, and that had value that would resided not in one's physical form, but in something that was outside of oneself that therefore could, could carry on beyond oneself, right? Um, and that idea of like, both like, extending myself towards another, but also of like sort of escaping the, the bounds of myself dumb um, were very appealing to me as a young age, which is why I got involved in like 
underground culture and and you know started making zines which was like a really important form to me and like from like high school days and like the mid 90s um kind of until the present day though this is now as transformed into more rarefied objects like the artist books um that you guys are holding and other more popular media like animation and stuff like that um or public art projects um so kind of as zoomed through a couple different paths but yeah it's just like the tools that i have yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I find it really interesting about how each of y'all came to art as a form of communication and really to zines in particular. I wanted to ask you about how, when you have an idea, um, how do you choose a medium for that idea? Like, what do you think, like, how does it relate to what you're trying to say? And we're especially focused on advocacy work in this talk, so, Maybe like when you want, when you see a problem, how do you like take that problem, have an idea, and then turn it into a piece of work and choose what you're going to use to make that work? I mean, I guess maybe I'll take that yeah, one yeah. first. Yeah. Um, like for me, it's like some like often it's just like as simple as like this is what I have or this is what I feel moved moved to use or like I'm on like a tear with like watercolors or I'm a, on a tear with paper cutting and that's where my brain's at and those are the things that are most readily at hand, you know? Um, and the mediums I've chosen are, are, were often chosen because of their like history of being linked to a certain kind of politics or a certain kind of culture, right? So like puppetry, um, printmaking, zines, stuff like that all comes out of like punk culture, all comes out of like a, of an explicitly lefty subculture. And so I was attracted to those mediums in the same way and at the same time as I was attracted to those ideas. So they're like kind of very well integrated in my brain. Um, when I'm like trying to like get an idea across, if I'm specifically trying to do something that has like a very activist intent, I'm usually not doing it alone, right? So that often is like, I'm usually like, you know, like for instance, like my current project that I'm uh, just finishing up, maybe is gonna continue a bit longer is like a series of animations that are done uh, about um, prison abolition. Uh, and I'm doing animation for it in part just because like that's what I decided on with the group the Amistad Law Project, who are really amazing, like abolitionist law collective. Um, that's what made sense to them, and that's what they felt like they could distribute through the channels that they had access to, which are mostly social media or, or online. Um, so yeah, I'm usually, if I'm like doing a thing that is like, I think of as being activist, I'm usually not doing it alone. So it's mm -hmm. usually developed in conversation with activist groups. And the great thing about those groups, um, the ones that you know, are good to work with. It's not always true. Even if somebody has great goals, they're not always easy to work with. Um, as I'm sure I am not always easy to work with. Um, but, but usually it's like based on what capacity they have to distribute things, right? Since they're good at getting the word out and I'm just a weird guy who makes things in his basement, you know? Uh, I guess for me, uh, I mean, to touch on what Eric was saying about art being what he has, and I feel like that's the same with me with like comics in particular, especially uh, when talking about like political or social issues. And I feel like it's the easiest, I mean, because I am often either like, like listening to podcasts with like either academics or activists who are talking about particular issues. And uh, I feel like that, you know, that sort of motivates me and, and sort of, you know, just helps me sort of just become stronger in my advocacy for these issues. But like it, it, for myself, I, I not, I don't think I would function as well as working, like for example, like an academic or, or writing a paper. But I feel like because of the visual element of of in the language of cartooning, which I which is something I have been comfortable with, and just because of becoming sort of enamored with the form, like from years ago, just reading like Archie comics or something, and then as I became older and uh, became more politicized, realizing, oh, you can actually use this same medium instead of doing like slapstick kind of funny stuff, which is also great, but you can also talk about like heavy stuff and in a way that's maybe accessible to people who, you know, who wouldn't get into something like a really complex, uh, like bit of scholarship or, or like a large text or anything. And so, com yeah, I felt like comics just, uh, it allows you to sort of, um, you know, reach a broader audience who, who can kind of like really kind of identify with the issues that way. And also in particular, uh, comics in like zine form is also great because it's easy to disseminate and they're cheap to make. And 
it's not in like a special space, like only for like a gallery wall or that kind of thing. Yeah, just like kind of as a follow up to that, could you like talk about maybe one piece that stands out to you and like talk us through maybe, maybe even one of the ones you have passed out here about how you like chose that medium and like use that to advocate? You want to go ahead? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You can go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Actually, that's for me. Sorry. No, it's fine. Um, yeah, I guess I can talk about uh, one of the, like, I guess, like, the, the an example of, like, the last page of the New Fears book, uh, I guess that's the one that's kind of more, very much uh, clearly about, like, climate change and kind of talking about, um, it, it's sort of, I'm, I'm not really, really moralizing there, but it's just kind of showing the passage of time and it's just uh, four panels and, and just kind of, it's a static space like in the world, but just showing um, how, uh, you know, I wanted to show like before the last panel where it's just kind of just open water kind of implying like, you know, clearly like uh, the effects of climate change and the melting of glaciers, et cetera. But the panel before that is just showing like a desert with like, um, like military fighter planes flying over. And I wanted to kind of make that link between uh, militarization and, for example, like the US Army is probably the largest polluter on the planet and in terms of like, uh, you know, uh, its effect on the climate and sort of draw that parallel in a very sort of simple, straightforward way. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting. And I think that's one of the things that I like about seeing, looking at this new fears work when I was looking at it online, right? Is that it has this, like art, right? has like a unique ability to both have like a little openness and resonance around it that like maybe will appeal to somebody who doesn't want to listen to like the dig or something. Right, as right. like, you know, yeah. as we probably both like to do listen to while we draw. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is one of the great things about drawing for a living is that you get to listen to lots of things. Um, <laughs> so that definitely resonated with me when you brought that up. Right, but like you can have a variety of approaches, even sometimes to the same subject matter. So, right, like I might, like if you look at the the Hard Rain Lydia from Cassiodorus book, like I don't think that that's like a broadly accessible object. I'm not making it to be disseminated. And when I make those kinds of artist books, they are mostly being distributed to like university library and museum collections, which is like who can pay for them, to be honest, you know, and that's part of the economic reality of my life. Um, they do get circulated because they're in a library space. They do get seen by students. They do get used in course materials because of the nature of that dissemination. But I'm not like pretending like it's a democratic multiple the same way when I made a $3 zine back in the 90s it was. You know, It does sit in a different space. So yeah. I'm not necessarily thinking like this is me going to change the world. This is like a space where I can both speak about this issue, speak about history, and speak about my own emotional response to those things, right? And that emotional response can sit beside something that's much more factual or historical and be given equal weight. And I think art is one of the few spaces where things can can sit in that field together. But like, for instance, you know, I did a project with this um, Women's Ecological Development, Organi Ecology and Development Organization, we do, um, that was working with like eight global uh, climate activists who are also feminist activists um, from around the world and I was like illustrating and setting their voices and like there's a very different set of questions that come into that work. There's like techniques that I learned from one of those worlds and bring to the other, right? Like whether it's just watercolor or like ways of using a narrative or like I think one of the things I bring to a lot of my work with activists is, is an understanding that I've developed through my own work that's a little more personal or a little more abstract at times of, of what what text does versus what image does and how those two things speak towards one another without necessarily having to be speaking in unison all the time, which is, I think, something comics are really good for, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so like, you know, with the book, like I was just like, oh, I should make a new book. Um, I haven't made a book in a little bit. This is what I'm, I read this text in a medieval history, or I know I actually listened to it in a medieval history audiobook while I was drawing. Um, and I was like, oh, this resonates so much with the modern day. So it's just finding that fragment and then letting it germinate and building things around it. Like I often talk about like constellating, right? Where it's like, here's one image, here's one text. How do they, how we draw the line between those things is what assigns the meaning the same way we assign meaning to the constellations in the sky, right? Um, so that can be often like, um, 
my personal work often accretes meaning by juxtaposition, um, if that makes sense. But like something like the We Do thing is like they asked me to do an animation, so I make an animation. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's much more a direct relationship yeah. between medium and thing. But the way the techniques are informed by all the other work that I make and all the other work that I consume, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What um, what you just said about history, Eric, um, was really like fascinating because I've been thinking about um, in relation to both your um, art that Anuj, you too also like, mentioned kind of like in your portraits of like minority groups and like marginalized people kind of drawing on like classical forms and like thinking about that. Um, and like in this current era where we don't really feel like we necessarily have like any sort of like historical precedent or understanding even for the way that our environment is like shifting and how we experience it. Um, do you feel like that kind of sense of like change in contrast with like tradition and history is a part of your work? And so like, how does it kind of show up? That's a good question. Uh, I do feel like, um, well, I guess in terms of the work that I'm the most comfortable with, again, focusing on the cartooning aspect, I feel like there is it is a continued conversation because it's a relatively young medium compared mm -hmm. to a lot of a lot of the other established yeah. like that have been established within like a fi fine art canon mm -hmm. and uh, and but it's the history of comics is not too difficult to sort of go go through and whether mm -hmm. it's like early newspaper strips or you know just early chat books that have been uh, you know passed around and I, I feel like it's uh, because it's always like to quote Art Spiegelman says it's like a bastardized medium mm -hmm. and. Uh, because it's neither like literature or or like pure visual like art like painting, um, because it's kind of like existing on the margins. It's easy to uh, you can kind of challenge more things. I feel mm -hmm. like and uh, you can be kind of subversive and and people don't you know it. it but it, at the same time, you will connect with people who are willing to go there and read the work and, and interact mm -hmm. with it. And and so I appreciate that freedom of like comics and cartooning. Yeah, I guess I don't know that it's like, uh, that there's not a historical reference point for this. I mean, that's what I was looking at with the Cassiodorus thing. Obviously, it's very different to have climactic change caused by a volcano exploding versus have it caused by, like, uh, you know, the way we fucked up the planet. Um, like, are two different things, but with similar effect, right? So what can we learn from, like, a historical understanding of, like, how those things have happened before? And I think, like... Um, you know, we are living in the midst of like a particular kind of apocalypse, but like when you look at his, when you have an understanding of history, you can understand, like I listened to this great CBC podcast that I always like had the dumbest titles. Like it was like, in, like about the zombie apocalypse or something. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be dumb, but I listened to it anyways. And, uh, but there was on that, apocalypse, on that uh, podcast, there was this indigenous woman who was like, oh, you wanna know what it's like to live through an apocalypse? Talk to an indigenous person. Like we've mm -hmm. already yeah. had our apocalypse. We're yeah living in the aftermath of that apocalypse. So I think we can look at, I think, and I think even like looking at medieval apocalyptic literature and sort of the, the understanding of how people live with doom, how people survive um, these horrific experiences. Like there have been so many waves and waves of, uh, you know, genocide, devastation, climactic change for other reasons, um, mass extinctions that have happened. Like we can learn from all of those things about like, both how to survive and adapt to that, but also how to uh, hopefully use them as cautionary tales, right? For how to avoid continuing to perpetuate other people's worlds ending. And uh, you know, now that we're seeing our own, like some of us are seeing our own worlds ending, like we're faced with those same questions, right? And um, maybe they're more present for us than they were before. Um, those of us who have the certain kinds of privilege, you know? Um, yeah, so I think that for me, that's one of the ways in which history informs it, but also, I mean, for me, some of that stuff also comes from like being a 12 year old boy who was into Dungeons and Dragons and Wizards and shit, you know? Um, so yeah. like that, which led me to like a love of medieval art that still informs my work, you know? So some of it is like very much like a particular desire path born of alienation. And some of it is like attempting to have a historical understanding of, of events, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you so much for answering our questions. I didn't 
have any follow-ups. Quinn, did you have a follow-up? I think that, um, Eric, what you mentioned about, like, the, um, like, the story of the indigenous woman and kind of, like, living through the apocalypse in the present is really profound, um, and I think with your, like, portraits and sketches that you were talking about and, um, your accordion book um, depicting kind of like all of these different current crises. Um, do you do you try to kind of confront the kind of ways in which like our current crises of climate change and political instability impact different groups um, in differing levels? Like, how do you feel like your art allows you to kind of like? grapple with that question if it does. I don't know. I mean, I think, right, like one of the things that art can hypothetically do is like mm -hmm. um, grab, grapple with like the commonality and the particular yeah. in the same space, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think it's like important, I think especially for me as like a white dude, like it's, uh, you know, straight, cis hat, white dude, you know, like to think about like not universalizing, right? Not yeah. like thinking that like my experience is the same as other people's experiences but I also do think that like you know I've done projects with people from a wide variety of backgrounds and definitely worked like did a big project with um, guys who had spent time in solitary confinement um, and in talking with I remember in particular talking to this um, amazing activist Hakeem Ali who I worked with closely on a project called Prisoner's Song um, like my loneliness it's not like it doesn't touch his loneliness or doesn't have anything in common with the loneliness he felt spending years and multiple, multiple years in solitary confinement, right? It would be foolish of me to pretend those were the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, but I do think that they're, they're connected and they're born of larger societal issues that do affect all of us. Obviously they affect us mm -hmm. drastically unequally, you know? But like, I do think that commonality can be a space of connection and of empathy that can transform into solidarity, that can transform into action, right? And I think that's something that I, I'm very interested in, in approaching, um, while still holding to the, like, the particularity of those things and not trying to speak for anyone else and not trying to like, conflate things that don't deserve to be conflated. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that Eric made about like, trying to, knowing that we're, fo we're very aware that we have certain uh, amount of privilege and, and space to like create this work and uh, we're able to like you know as opposed to just trying to like work for a living or, or living under like really really severe extreme uh, conditions and I yeah in the same way when I am trying to either tell this story or like an experience of like a Syrian immigrant or uh, draw a parallel between the war machine and then like the sort of monotony of like ca existing in late capitalism mm -hmm. i i feel like in in a way in a way like using using comics or using like the, like visual narratives is a way to sort of try to draw out empathy from like people who have no experience mm -hmm. uh you know what what it's like living in an extremely uh, marginalized community or in a, a high conflict zone and there's, I feel like there are, in other forms, especially very, very extremely commercialized forms of media, like in film, especially in Hollywood film, um, you often see, I feel like it's, the, this sort of empathy is try, very exploitative, or, it, or it's often directed toward, it's clearly directed towards a privileged audience, whether, you know, and I think because we're able to kind of be a little more raw with our work, like, I think for both of us, we, we can try to, like, we don't have to necessarily listen to who, we're not trying to like cater to like a specific yeah. sort of audience. So mm -hmm. we can challenge some of that stuff more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's interesting because I was looking, when I was looking at some of your work online, I was like really struck by some of the empathy and the renderings. And so I kind of wanted to ask you about that. I feel like in certain circles, like empathy gets a little bit of like short shrift or something mm -hmm. these days. Yeah. It's like not maybe fashionable. Right, <laughs> right. Or because of like, like a heightened awareness of the striations of society, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, there is like a, a conflation of empathy and that, that false universality that centers whiteness, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'd be curious to hear any more thoughts about that that you have. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it's kind of, it gets, like it's easy to overthink that, right? And, and um, you know, at the end of the day, like people are gonna take what they want from, from the work, especially if it's more ambiguous. And yeah. I think some projects, 
I, I do want to sort of draw like a, a very clear line of criticism, like of growing, of like the, the just vast extreme disparities of like, um, you know, disenfranchisement between like, and especially as the wealth gap just grows to these extreme levels now, um, I think I feel comfortable because I've obviously lived in, in a privileged space and have some access to sort of, um, to, to some of these like living, living comfortably in a way compared to like living like in the space of like a refugee or, or somebody who's incarcerated. And, and so, uh, again, I'm just doing it technically by observation, but I'm hoping to draw s some sort of, uh, empathy from people from like, who are maybe not able coming from that same space of disenfranchisement and then just having them at least like interrogate how they're like not a part of the, these two, di these different worlds. I don't know if that makes sense. But. Yeah. I mean, it touches on something that I think about a lot, which is like my role as like when I'm depicting someone else, like of like as like first witness, right? Like, cause yeah. I'm like yeah. beholding that person and then I'm depicting that person. But like to some extent, like I want to, I'm like modeling through my perception of that other, like um, how I want them, how I want my viewer to view them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like, I'm like the first viewer sure, sure. in a way or the first witness. And yeah. then hopefully that like extends and that tone extends and allows people to sort of soften into perceiving someone in yeah. a particular way. Yeah, and like I think that's really important, like being a witness and, and you know, at, at the end of the day you can't be an objective witness, that's impossible, yeah. right? But at least you are trying to, you are focusing on maybe like a voice or a, a, an experience that isn't getting like the spotlight or that people won't have access to. I think those are all like really important observations to keep in mind um, as like people who make art in this moment because it almost feels impossible to kind of create things that are not kind of grappling with just all of the um, immense systemic like injustices that are kind of crashing into each other right now but um, it's a huge question of like how to do that responsibly in a way that is kind of like self-aware and um, not necessarily perpetuating those kinds of imbalances in the way as you like make your own art. Not that it has the same like impact necessarily as those like injustices themselves, but um, I feel like I at least also think a lot about how in my like writing or zine making, um, how to kind of speak and think about what's going on in a way that is not just kind of like super egocentric and kind of focalized um, in that manner. Uh, what time is it? Excellent. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, cool. Hi. Um, I uh, my question was for both of you. Uh, I was wondering how you, um, like, both of you have made art that is activist in nature. Uh, wondering how, like, what what are some of the challenges in actually creating art that are, is activist in nature, and how uh, you can make that better. Like, what are some of the challenges you've seen in trying to Activize your art. I don't know if that's a like that's not necessarily a word, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I can. Um, I mean, I think it's like there's a lot of different challenges, right? There's like the challenges of making any piece of art, like whether or not it's like good or connects to anyone. You know, like the aesthetic questions, right? The impact questions. I think there's also sometimes like I guess someone who makes a lot of activist work in collaboration with activists. Um, it can be challenging, right? Like activists have like a particular set of concerns. They're very concerned with like a certain kind of messaging. They want to make every, like the tendency I think in a lot of activist culture is to make things very obvious, which I think sometimes, um, and make sure that their point is not misunderstood, which is like, makes a lot of sense, right? And I think like, like when I think about like my current collaborations with Amistad, like there's like, we often in those conversations are like separating out like, what's a communicative concern or a messaging concern, right? That they might have to make sure that 
things are accessible to people, that things that it connects with as broad of an audience or their particular audience as possible. Um, and then I, my concerns to make it like what good or what it have a little breathing room or whatever. And those things are not necessarily always at odds, but sometimes it's something like we, they'll be like, well, we have the, like, you know, for instance, like, um, we're doing this video series, it's distributed online, so we're using subtitles. But like the subtitles, like often to be as legible as they could be, take up a lot of visual space, and I don't like that. So we there's like a push and pull right there, um, which is like a very benign example. Sometimes those things get a little more heated um, between like the communicative intent and the like the uh, communicative intent and like the aesthetic intent, right? And I think that that can often be a very productive tension. Sometimes it can be a counterproductive tension. But I think for me, when when I'm a when I have like a good respectful relationship with those people I'm collaborating with, um, it's great. It works out wonderfully, and those conversations come up with new solutions or interesting compromises when they're, you know, when it's not when there's not that built up mutual respect for each other's crafts. And I think it goes both ways, right? That like artists need to respect activists, and our activists need to respect artists. Um, like, you know, it can go awry. It can be a, end up being at loggerheads. Yeah, that's a, like, to your point, like, working with, um, it depends what the, like, actual piece is going to be. So whether it's going to be a piece of, like, propaganda, like, you know, like a positive way, like a flyer that will be used for an action, or if it's, like, a logo even, or, uh, like, a logo for, like, a social justice organization that's, of course, there's a lot of um, collaboration involved, and as Eric said, like working with like the organizers, and sometimes, often, there's like a list of points or actual things that they want on the flyer, or they want like visually depicted, and that that's where the sol problem solving challenges come up, and and sort of uh, you know, trying to execute the most clear and concise way that satisfies like us as the artist, and then of course the organizers. But uh, I think with personal projects that are talking about political stuff, I, um, at the end of the day, that's just after doing it a bunch of times, usually I know when I'm like, how much time I'll devote to whether it's like a two panel comic or, uh, or just a standalone illustration. Um, it's just after being comfortable, um, at the end of the day, I'm like my own editor and, and know when I'm just sort of like putting it out, when it's ready to be put out into the world. And you had a question too? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah thank you um, for your um, kind of uh, all the points you made. I had a follow up on kind of working with people. Um, how uh, do you have any advice uh, for, let's say, artists or writers or anyone who like wants to uh, work on um, different issues of how to kind of seek people to work with? Um, instead of like waiting for commissions, how to like oh, reach out to other artists or museums or li like how do you build coalitions if you are kind of working in your own kind of bubble and want to kind of reach out? Um, I mean, that's how, for me, that's how, I can only speak for myself, right? Like, and, and I think I came and in, entered into that space in a slightly different era because I'm a bit older. Um, like so for me that involved like being involved in like activist culture from the get-go and often like being willing to be like a like a grunt worker you know like a lot of like like i do work that a lot of people consider activists i don't always consider it as activist a lot of my artwork is activist as other people tend to consider it um even though i do do specific collaborations with people that are activist in intent but i think my a lot of my activism is stuffing envelopes you know it's like it's just like doing like really grunt work and that's like probably like at the end of the day maybe more effective than any art I've ever made. Um, <laughs> arguable, you know? Um, but like, so I think for me that's like being in community with activists, being uh, willing to do like the really unglamorous work of it has led to a lot of my collaborations as an artist and then also just like being consistent in making and putting out that work on my own for a long time. Before then I was able to have the privilege to like be doing it for a living, I feel like I had to pay dues for, which I think dues paying is like a kind of like a old fat, a very old fashioned thing, but also has been like how my life has functioned. I'm not saying that like other people should therefore have to pay dues, um, but I don't know. I think being in community with it, being willing to do unglamorous things are great places to start. 
listening, you know. Um, and yeah, if you're passionate about an idea, like maybe, you know, if you're passionate about a cause, like maybe finding the people who are doing dynamic work about that and be like, how can I support you? I have this set of skills. And maybe the skills they want are like word processing and they're not like drawing, but like, you know, you can do that too, you know? Um, but like just putting it out there. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with Eric there. and. Um, it also, like, I think some of my early more political art was usually it was informed by, like, either working with, like, activist organizations or groups. Um, back in, like, uh, the early 2000s, I was, when I was living in Queens and uh, working with a uh, social justice organization called DRUM, and that stands for Daisies Rising Up and Moving, and uh, they were... Um, you know, I just kind of similar to what Eric was saying, just like helping with like distribution of like like pamphlets or newsletters, et cetera, uh, just doing that type of work. But then also, uh, they they saw some of my artwork and then you know wanted me to do like a logo for them or create like flyers and do more visually oriented things. And in that sense, it was like being on the ground with people. But I feel like now, especially in plague times, when maybe it's harder to uh, meet with people. You know, of course, like things like Instagram or, um, you know, specific, especially Instagram is for all of its frustrations and anxieties that it can in induce. I think that when you can see like uh, people from all over the world creating powerful political work, and if it does, if you do identify with it or you feel like you could do some sort of collaboration with someone, there's nothing wrong with like directly um, DMing them or writing, even writing in their comments or something. And uh, I know a lot of people who have like met other artists that way and, and formed collaborations in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that like forming community with other like-minded artists can be a really helpful thing for me. Like I've been a member of this artist cooperative um, that was started in 2007 called Just Seeds. And like a lot of the work that I've done, like I've gained so much more even just like on a, like a brute careerist level, like by like being in cooperation versus competition. I think like art school and like a lot of the art, art world writ large can like really foster this sense of we all have to be in competition all the time. But finding like-minded artists and building community with them can also be really powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, I really appreciate the insight that you bring to the work that you're doing, um, the way that you're responding to the discourses around you, uh, especially to climate change and the climate emergency. Um, you've been talking a lot about um, collaboration with activists, and I wonder if you could also talk about your experience uh, collaborating with academics, if you have. I gather through podcasts you sort of do, um, but uh, with, with academics sort of in the same room, and whether you see opportunities um, sort of to work with academics who are concerned about the climate emergency and specifically sort of urgently about it. Um, yeah, actually that's a, that's a really good question. I, so I did actually uh, do a recent uh, piece. It was a comic for the Nib. Uh, that was specifically about the anniversary of 9-11. And so that one I, I was a collaboration with uh, an academic a friend and colleague um, named Dr. Nazia Kazi. And it was basically, she had a text that was an excerpt, kind of an updated excerpt from one of her books. Uh, and the whole piece is basically talking about how um, ever since like the events of September 11th, uh, every year there's constant like reminders of to never forget or there's like this entire culture of never forgetting but it's not so much the 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 sort of demand or like request to like the general public the american public like to not forget is just stripped of its like historical sort of like root causes and uh the comic was basically speaking to what like the important thing never forget is important but uh it's it's like it's important to remember what were, what actually were the causes, like American foreign policy and economics and, and, and the war machine. And uh, her text was uh, very good at illuminating and getting to the like exact causes and the reasons and like the the legacy of like September 11th. And I feel like uh, as a standalone text, it, it's powerful. But uh, by adding visuals and making it into a comic form, uh, it could be introduced to a larger audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm hoping that we succeeded in sort of like allowing it to be a little more uh, widespread and easily accessible. And um, I think that 
that's the important thing. It, like working with academics is, is very rich and very important, but uh, sometimes just assigning someone reading or an article can be a little more difficult, and, can, and especially if they are coming from a non, like their education background is limited. And again, using comics or using a visual like sort of method uh, allows it to be a little more easily understandable. Yeah, I have like a complicated relationship with academia as someone who barely graduated high school and has no higher education. Um, and like, you know, is largely like either self-taught or friend-taught, you know, peer-taught. Um, and I think, yeah, which is funny, but then end up in these spaces more and more often in my life, um, which is interesting and kind of fun. Um, and I, love, I get a perverse glee out of being like, I barely graduated high school. Um, but like, because I do think there is a class component to education, right? And I think there's like an accessibility component that comes along with it. And so some of the ways that this discourse happens, right, um, just becomes default rarefied. I mean, even me using the word rarefied is rarefied, right? And like I pick it up too. Um, but as someone comes from like a relatively working working to lower middle class background, you know, I definitely like when I talk to my cousins, I'm like, oh yeah, this is like a very different world, you know, who like work in factories and stuff. Um, and yeah, so I do think there's something of art like potentially has the potential like like he was saying of um, like breaking down those levels of communication. I don't know that my work always necessarily does that, um, but I think it's a worthwhile question to hold as one makes work. Sometimes work does want to be rarefied and abstracted and and nuanced and particular in particular ways, and sometimes it wants to be very broad and and open, you know, and sometimes those things can exist at the same time. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in, I've worked with academic institutions perhaps more than I've worked with particular academics, and I've worked with archi the archive a lot. The archive is very important space to me, right, and doing research. Like I did a, was invited to do this project with, um, with Swarthmore a couple years ago called Friends, Peace, and Sanctuary that was like working, doing like a book arts project with their library. Um, and speaking with some of the academics there, but largely was engaged in the archive. And what I was interested in the archive was first person testimonials in terms of people speaking about displacement. And also they facilitated me being in touch with this community of Syrian and Iraqi folks who had resettled um, in Philadelphia. Um, and I mean, I thought that was really enriching and I really enjoyed the conversations with the academics. But what I enjoyed more was the way the academics were shepherding this body of first person oral history material. And that to me, I had a more live connection to than I did necessarily to the academic source or the academic mediation of those things. But I was very grateful to academia for preserving and keeping open those spaces. And I think that's like a challenge, I guess I would put forth to academia is like, how, how, how are they facilitating um, those voices without necessarily extracting value or putting their own stamps on them. Um, not to say like in terms of scientific research or other things, so like that level of research isn't warranted or it shouldn't be supported or anything, you know. That's a very roundabout way of engaging with that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I find, I find that absolutely fascinating. And of course, if you have a question, um, we'll get a mic to you, just raise your hand. Um, I do want to say, like, I come from a background, personally, that is um, a very small town in North Carolina. Um, and it has been really interesting to me here at Penn to have experienced higher education. And now even, like, reading the news makes more sense, just having that extra leg up. And I've always found a deep appreciation for art that makes that more accessible. Like, whether it's through comics, um, those are, like, for like the age I am and where I was, like that was a lot of what I looked at. And like through more, through more fine arts, um, trying to get access to those can be more difficult, but it also allows an expansion of the conversation. And I really appreciate that both of y'all are doing that. Uh, I had a question, uh, another one. Uh, so I'm wondering how, um, as kind of artists that are already kind of established, how you can or we can in general as people uh, inspire and incentivize the future artists to create art that cha changes, makes an impact against climate change? Uh, if you have any words on about that. I mean, I think one good thing that artists can do is demystify the making of art, right? Like I think there's like, there's nothing 
particularly unique about artists. They just have chosen to be obsessed with this one weird thing and they just are, you know, do it and you do it for a long time and eventually you get good at it. It's like, in some ways, there's like a simple arithmetic to it of it's just like labor hours, right? Um, and so I would always just encourage people to like, don't think you need like a, a super specialized skill set to make something creative, you know, and I don't, or to make something communicative, like, and like maybe your gift isn't drawing, maybe it's collage or maybe it's speaking or maybe it's envelope stuffing, you know, or whatever. There's so many different ways to participate in meaningful change and and the least, like just to reiterate, the least glamorous ones can often be the most important, but also like just in terms of making art, like it's, it's like I say, I always say this thing about like any medium, like for me it was printmaking when I first started doing screen printing, like I learned in this guy's basement and he had just like a old window on two saw horses and a construction light and he <laughs> timed his exposures to a Fela Kuti song and he knew when he was like coming to the last <laughs> drum break that it was time to turn it off. Like that's like $10 worth of equipment, right? You know, um, and like, you can learn that shit. You can learn it from watching videos on YouTube. You can learn it by talking to people who have more experience. I'm always happy to talk to talk to young artists about like technical things and try to share those skills. But like you know, all that information is so accessible nowadays. And like, it's like one of these things, right? You can learn the basics really quickly and then spend the rest of your life perfecting what you do with those basics. So it's like not that hard to get started, but it can be a life's journey to continue to grow and enrich oneself within art, you know, and to challenge oneself within it. Um, so yeah, I would just encourage people to make shit and also just like make a bunch of bad shit and maybe you don't have to show it to anyone. Maybe you do and they tell you that it's bad and you, you know, like feel a little hurt about it and then you make something better. Um, you know, I hope you don't get shut down by that. Um, and like making bad shit is a really important part of making anything worthwhile. And you know, even as someone in his 40s who's been doing this shit for 20 years, like, um, I make bad shit all the time and throw it out and then make, make something better the next day. Um, so I would just, yeah, yeah. And feel, yeah, and always feel free to like reach out to people. I think like, especially in like more underground arts world or in activist art worlds, the distance from like hero to peer is really short, you know? And I found that like that was something that was important to me as a young artist was like reaching out to people who are a little more experienced but within the similar field. And I often found like nobody owes you their time, but Oh, there's a lot of people who are willing to like have a chat, you know. Sometimes young artists will reach out to me, and I'm always like, "If you can call me on the phone while I'm drawing, I will talk to you forever." <laughs> if you want me to write you an email, I, I, it's going to take me a very long time. <laughs> yeah, I completely endorse everything Eric's saying. Um, I, I believe, like, what, also one part of your question was, "How can this be used in like the fight to like address climate change?" Right, and that's like a hugely I mean, it's like one of the greatest challenges of our times and, and there's just so much misinformation, especially, uh, and so much of the misinformation is like through mainstream media and, and all forms is that it comes down to the individual, which is like total bullshit. And like this whole idea of us like recycling even is like, that's already, that's, that's also bullshit. Like in, when I, I mean that in, in terms of like the individual, like putting like your like plastic cups into like a little bag and then taking it to the the recycling bin and the thing at like that these are just such like like micro efforts that aren't actually going to do anything the, the largest polluters are these multinational corporations and military like the armies across the world so they're like don't like feel bad if you're not using like the right bag or something when you're going to the grocery store if you're still using plastic i mean that's i'm saying i'm not like going against people who are making individual decisions to sort of like sort of be a little more mindful of that, but I'm saying like it's going to involve like creating large coalitions and, and large activist co coalitions and like communication, which is where the art comes in, like and disseminating these ideas a, 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 like across a large groups of people who are like maybe people who are disengaged and don't even or think everything is hopeless. And again, it will come down to like doing like actual direct action and being on the streets and whether it's protesting or whether it's like, um, you know, protesting in front of like uh, CEOs houses and things like that. I mean, it's, it's such an overwhelming challenge, but I, I think what's been prescriptive through the media on how to do it on an individual level is extremely misguided. And I, it's, it's really gonna come down to like, um, it's really gonna come down to challenging these larger forces that are actually 
doing so much more pollution and, and are this really like the source causes of that. And um, Eric kind of covered everything about like, you know, doing your own work for yourself. And yeah, just like, uh, I, th I feel now, again, with like the internet and social media, um, the good things about it, uh, taking away the anxiety it, it creates and all that, <laughs> but like the good things about it is you can, you just have access to more people doing different types of work and people are in very different stages of their careers and uh, you, you can support each other and, and reach out and just through practice repetition, uh, you'll get better and you'll gain confidence, especially when you work with other people as well. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I agree with that 100%. And like, I think there's like, yeah, I always frame it as like, there's this conflation of ethics and politics, right? Like, yes, to some extent, politics is ethics and action, but also like, they, those two are different strategies that do different things. And like, ethics are important, you know, and like, you know, I try to bring my own bag every as much as I can, and you know, I put things in the recycling, even though I'm pretty sure that that just goes in the dumpster, anyways. <laughs> but uh, you know, I try. You know, and like, I think it's important to like, I think ethics are important, but like, I don't think one should conflate them with political political action, one's personal ethics. You know, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. No. Um, thank you so much for uh, adding that that aspect and your thoughts. I know that art. If nothing else, it allows so much time for thinking as you're sitting there drawing. Um, anyways, I kind of wanted to, I think we're ending our time, nearing the end of our time at least. Um, and I wanted to wrap up with maybe a suggestion from each of y'all of like a piece of work that's like stood out to you recently, something to keep an eye on. Um, any suggestions? You can have a minute to think about it. <laughs> um. I guess like uh, if people can check out the nib, like just that recent piece about 9/11, uh, I would just suggest people, you know, anyone with like who can go online can just check it out. And it's called, um, I, I believe it's called. Uh, now it's either Never Forget or uh, or, or um, they they titled it something different. Sorry, but if if you go to the the nib, you'll you'll see it. Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm always like a little confounded when it comes to like, if, if I'm speaking of my own work, I think the Practical Abolition series is like with Amistad, which you can find easily on like their website or on Twitter or whatever. Um, somehow I'm like shadow banned on Instagram right now. So I don't know how oh much. God, really? yeah. I don't know. Wow. I mean, or, or something like it's just like I all of a sudden have a tenth of what I used to have. Oh, um, but uh, it's very bizarre. Yeah, Anyways, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, of my own work. And then I think like um, maybe like I've been thinking a lot about, so I work with this group called Address This that specifically works around, uh, uh, like helps run a correspondence course with incarcerated people that I'm just a volunteer for. Um, and one of the things that came across our thing that's being made by other people in the world is this book called Weology that I've been really moved by that was written largely by folks who are in uh, Pennsylvania prisons um, that speak, them speaking about, um, in some senses to one another, about transformative justice and how transformative justice is actually functioning behind bars um, in facilities in Pennsylvania. And I would just encourage people, it's put out by this group called the Lifelines Project, um, who share a lot of personnel with address this and our friends um, who, yeah, I think that's like a thing that's in the world that I recently have been moved by that I would encourage people to look at. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Yeah. I mean, thank you both for um, coming out and just like, sharing all of your thoughts about like art and how we kind of interact with the world through it and share our thoughts and connect with people and thanks everybody for coming out it was a great mm -hmm. evening thank you yeah. thank you <laughs>